You know, this Falcon Northwest system is such a nice workstation that it makes me think I've been doing it wrong for many years. It's 56 cores. It's a Xeon W workstation. Right now, I've got the 4090 in there. I'm going to show you how to do this ultimate machine learning setup with a 4090. You can get it outfitted with RTX 6000s, you know, the highest end CUDA accoutrement that you can think of. But we're going to run through this, and it's a little strange. If you follow me, you know I'm a big fan of Linux. We're going to set up Linux under WSL, which is suboptimal as far as Linux goes, but I think it's a much better development environment than just raw naked Windows, even with PowerShell. I really think that WSL2 offers a lot of really awesome stuff, whether you're doing Docker development or Python development, machine learning is kind of the focus for this video. And like most videos that talk about sort of complicated stuff, there's a guide on the level one forum that will sort of walk you through step by step. But we're going to move kind of fast. We're going to hit the highlights. If you need something that's a little bit more lower level, uh, by all means, comment in the forums and that'll help shape future content. Or if you're stuck, you know, what I know you're stuck on will definitely help. But even if you have a machine that's not as nice as this machine from Falcon Northwest, you should be able to follow along and set this up. And if you have a non-CUDA machine, it's going to be a little trickier. Uh, we might cover that in a future video. For today, we're mostly going to focus on getting CUDA 12 point something, 12.1 in this case, set up, up and running. And I'll even show you how to set up stable diffusion with the automatic 1111 web GUI by the time we get to the end of it. I'd like to touch on Docker and a few other things for a second, but uh, there's probably not going to be enough time in this video. There's not really anything special about Docker anyway, but we'll talk about that as we go. Let's dive in. Now, I guess for this video, I can live without 100 gigabit. I mean, I just don't know how I'm gonna make it through with only the built-in 10 gigabit ethernet interfaces on this motherboard. 100 gig is so much nicer. All right, the first thing I'm gonna do is run Windows Terminal. Windows Terminal is nice. You should have Windows Terminal. Uh, I'm doing all this on Windows 22 H2, which you should probably also have. I mean, I know the temptation is to keep Windows 10 on life support as long as possible, but look, if it's that much of a problem, just go to Linux. It's not going, Microsoft is going to keep juicing the start menu analytics from now until the end of time. You might as well just go to Linux if that bothers you. Otherwise, embrace your Windows 22 H2 overlords and get that installed. You should get Windows Terminal for free. The other command line utility you should have is Winget. So when you run Winget, you should get some output similar to what I've gotten here. If you don't, you need to install an update for the the app installer, like the app installer package. There's a link for that in the guide. But we want to do Winget install Microsoft Visual Studio Code and get and mobatech.moba xterm. xterm is a terminal program that I kind of like for remote systems. We're actually not even really going to use that in this video. Just thought I'd mention it because I like it. Winget is what we call a package manager. Package management is something that should have been here since Windows 95. It's a pretty common staple of pretty much all Linux distributions since about circa 1990. Just some utility that will help you manage software that's installed. So instead of navigating a website with crappy ads that try to trick you into clicking on them so that you download and install malware on your computer, which then you know, farms your computer for ads from now until the end of time in order to make money. You just do Winget install and hope that the malware people haven't figured that out yet to install malware in the repository. And so you can install all kinds of things like Visual Studio Code and Git and Mobile X Term. Now, technically, you could also install Git under the Windows subsystem for Linux. A recurring theme in this video is going to be the split personality you're giving your computer because stuff lives on the Windows side and stuff lives on the Linux side. Wax on, wax off. You see how that works? It can be really confusing for the uninitiated because Microsoft has done a lot to try to make the Windows container running under Linux as seamless as possible. And we're gonna rely on that seamlessness in a lot of cases here, but it's still fundamentally two different systems. And that's something you have to keep in mind as you work. So you have to think about how to keep track of your files, where your files live, etc., etc. We'll talk more about that when we get there, but we're going to need Git on both the Windows side and the Linux side, so just keep that in mind. There's also another utility that I like that doesn't really have anything to do with the perfect workstation except it lets you keep an eye on the sensors in your computer and it's hardware info. 
Hardwell Info is a great program. Now, because I have an ASUS motherboard in our fancy Falcon Northwest workstation, it gives us a warning that there is a sensor chip for the embedded controller that ASUS uses on this motherboard. Because ASUS has not been forthcoming with documentation about how this works and to make this a smooth experience for end users, because ASUS does not care about end users, I think, we're gonna say do not monitor this sensor. At the risk of sounding like a broken record, our Falcon Northwest system is the fastest Xeon W you're going to get because they've, they've tuned it to operate beyond the minimum wattage that Intel specifies, and it's perfectly stable, which is an impressive accomplishment. But that nevertheless, this will help me keep an eye on the temperatures and wattages and voltages and what's going on with my drive. It is a PCIe 5 drive, which is very nice from a development standpoint. So a lot of, lot of interesting metrics here. I'm just going to minimize it for now, but it'll keep track of everything. So that's handy. This is a great way to install other browsers as well. Firefox, Chrome, Chromium. You can also pick the developer version of Firefox by just changing the parameter here. OBS project, Crystal Disk Mark for running disk benchmarks. Sometimes developers can wear out SSDs. Yeah, Git, dealing with a bunch of little tiny files. You can wear out an SSD prematurely, especially if you've got a Samsung drive that's got the, the faulty firmware. Uh, their drives were wearing out very, very prematurely. Uh, so you need a firmware update and some other stuff. Once you get the firmware update, it's not really a big deal though. And of course, VLC for movie playback because Windows 11 with all of its stuff still wants to charge you for that HEVC codec. You don't need that. You need VLC. Oh, I could also plug SysInternals for a moment. SysInternals is a suite of utilities for Mark Rustinovich, who Microsoft hired. And included in the SysInternals utility suite is something called Process Explorer. Think of it like Process Manager, but on steroids. And in the last couple Windows updates, Task Manager has gotten a little bit more Fisher Price, let's say. And I do mean that in kind of a negative way. Process Explorer is more like what developers would use and find handy. So we'll, we'll use Winget to install that as well. Speaking of things that should have been bundled with Windows, Power Toys. If you don't have Power Toys, you need Power Toys. Now there's a whole bunch of really interesting stuff in Power Toys. Two of the handiest things is Alt Space, which lets you start typing for things. In this case, Process Explorer as a running process and switch to them. If you're a Mac user, this will probably seem familiar. Yes, it's like the thing on Mac. Or if you're a Linux user, yes, there's a thing like this on Linux as well. I don't know why Windows doesn't have this. It's dumb that it doesn't, but here it is. It's part of Power Toys, which is also from Microsoft and really probably should be installed by default. I don't know why it's not, but it is. And then there's also fancy zones. You've got a giant monitor like I do, or several giant monitors, or a wall of giant monitors. Fancy zones lets you kind of sort of have a tiling window manager experience. Ooh, there's some fun things you can Google later to go down a rabbit hole because tiling window managers are a lot of fun. But it lets you create non-standard arrangements of windows that the windows will snap to. Like, you know how you can snap a program to the left or right half of the display? Well, Fancy Zones lets you go beyond that. Quick mention of Mouse Without Borders. If you use a laptop and a desktop, and you'd like to use your keyboard and mouse to control your laptop and your desktop at the same time, Mouses Without Borders is pretty cool. You run it on your two different machines, and when your cursor hits the edge of the window on this computer, it'll automatically go to the other computer. It's not, it's, it's kind of like a KVM, except you don't have monitor switching. You just move where the keyboard and mouse focus is. It sends the mouse and keyboard information over the network, which sometimes, you know, if your network is a little flaky, is suboptimal. But most of the time, 99% of the time, that thing's actually fine. Awake is a tray icon that will keep your computer from going to sleep. If you're reading something or watching something and you don't want the display to go to sleep because you've got it normally set for like five minutes, Awake is really nice. It's like caffeine on Linux if you're familiar with that. And there's a bunch more stuff here, but I'll also mention Quick Mute or Video Conference Mute. So this is like a global mute that mutes everything, which is handy sometimes. But that's enough about power toys. The last thing I have listed in the how-to guide here is when get installed Tailscale, but understand what Tailscale is. It's a VPN service. So if you're not ready to uh, understand what Tailscale will do for you and install the Tailscale, Tailscale client and set up a Tailscale account online, which is free, well, there's, it's freemium, uh, then you don't need to bother with Tailscale right now. The next major step in our configuration here is setting up the Windows subsystem for Linux. First, I'm gonna do WSL hyphen hyphen install because it's not been set up before. Uh, you can also do this through the Windows GUI, but I'm just gonna skip over that part. By default, this will set you up with Ubuntu, which is fine because every guide on planet Earth is on with Ubuntu. 
and you know that's fine that's totally fine we'll make this one about ubuntu as well i really also like the manjaro distribution pop os for beginners for gaming although pop os in this scenario even though they've done a lot of work to make cuda work the work that they've done to make cuda work does not involve cuda working under the windows subsystem for linux so pop os in this scenario not a good recommendation Fedora is also weirdly well documented on NVIDIA's side. Well, Red Hat, I should say, and by extension, Fedora. So I think that NVIDIA is aware that a lot of enterprise customers are adopting Red Hat Enterprise Linux, and a lot of NVIDIA's own documentation is around that distribution. That said, NVIDIA's documentation is just as good, if not better, around Ubuntu. So we're going to stick with Ubuntu. You should get a pop-up similar to this one that is basically asking us to set a new username and password. I know we just set it up, but <laughs> Linux also has lots of updates that we'll want to install. It doesn't install at inconvenient times, but we should just go ahead and do it now. And one thing you want to run in another terminal, or in a Windows terminal, is WSL-L-V, as I've done here, just to make sure that you're on WSL v2. Version 1 of WSL, it was a valiant attempt, it was nice. WSL2 is so much better in so many ways, especially when you've got 56 cores to work with. It's it's more akin to true virtualization than a lightweight shim pass-through thingy, although other parts of Windows are a lightweight shim pass-through thingy. But in terms of running processes and being not unusably slow, WSL2 is a win. Now with this open, let me show you a cool trick. Explorer.exe dot. Now if you're a little bit familiar with computers, you know that you can't run a, a D exe on Linux, at least not without wine, and yet, it works fine. Some of the plumbing that Microsoft and Canonical have done to try to make this kind of thing work. And it's given me a, a path here that is my uh, home directory on the Linux side of things. And if we look at the path here in, in File Explorer, we see that it looks like a network path. And you should think of it as a network path. You should think of this as the whole thing as, you know, the separation, the left and right brain of, of your machine, if you will. So as you're doing operations with Git or working with code on the Linux side of things, you want to keep the files on the Linux side of things rather than the Windows side of things and vice versa for the Windows side of things. <laughs> There's actually some really hilarious blog posts from old Microsoft where they talk about the incredible danger that comes from someone saying, I'll just keep my Git repo on my desktop and then I can access my desktop through Linux. You can slash mnt slash c slash users Wendell desktop. Yeah, look, there's all my desktop crap. Uh, you do not want to do that though. It's going to lead to a lot of problems. You can also run Visual Studio Code the same way, code space dot. You'll get an initial pop-up from Visual Studio Code saying, hey, wsl.localhost is not trusted. Should we allow that? Yeah, it's fine. And then, hey, should I trust the authors? Yeah, it's fine. And so now, boom, you're in Visual Studio Code. I'm getting a little ahead of myself here, but there are some extensions that you want to install if you're going to work this way. They're from Microsoft, don't worry. Uh, remote Development and WSL. See WSL here? Open any folder and yeah, we want to install that. And connect to WSL as a default distro. And then we want to go ahead and install Remote Development. We'll come back to why this is useful as we get into more actual development, but this just makes it easy for you to have the uh, files and the project living on the Linux side of things, but you get a nice interactive GUI on the Windows side of things. And this is running on the Windows side of things. But you can run Linux GUI apps as well. I mean, you could run Visual Studio Code under Linux. Heck, we can even run Edge for Linux under WSL, not to confuse things. It's not as efficient, but you can use that for debugging and testing. In fact, if you're doing web development, uh, automating the Chrome browser or the Chromium engine is a big part of debugging. And this is a thing that web developers suffer under daily and or use and find handy, depending on your perspective. Now installing Edge is a little trickier. Microsoft actually provides a Debian slash Ubuntu format repository for Edge. I'm gonna apt install Microsoft Edge stable. And oh boy, that installs a ton of stuff. Probably should read through that and see what all it's installing so you don't accidentally uninstall your C drive. Usually that's okay unless it makes you ask two or three times. It's installed in slash opt by default, which is pretty cool that Microsoft tries to be organized and puts everything there. So let's try to run it from there. And there we are, Microsoft Edge on Linux, kinda, more or less. 
Now, there's not a super amount of video acceleration there. In fact, very little at all. But it's nice that you can do that. So don't get any fancy ideas like, oh, I'll be able to run Steam for Linux under that and get it working. There are people working on that, but it's not ready yet. Another thing that you'll notice is uh, tab completion. If you do a tab to complete your file as you're working from the command line, it's a little slow. And this is because on a complex system, there's a lot of stuff in the Windows file path. So when you bring up a Windows command prompt and you type something, you hit tab to complete in the Windows file prompt. It searches through the Windows side of the system. That path carries over to Linux automatically by this WSL system. I don't like that because it makes things slow. So how you turn that off is you edit uh, slash etc slash WSL.conf. And then when you restart WSL, it won't automatically append the Windows path to the path that exists uh, in the WSL container. I find that things are a lot faster at the command line on the Linux side for that. And you can also add the path back to your bash profile, to your Linux profile. If this is some kind of crazy moon language, don't worry about it for right now. This is just something that you can learn about to do a little bit more setup to make your development machine the perfect efficient development machine. It's just like, well, why is it slow? I'm telling you why it's slow and I'm telling you what you need to Google to fix it. Now getting CUDA set up is pretty easy. I'm gonna assume that you have not set up CUDA on your Windows machine. You've actually probably got the gaming driver installed because you probably have a gaming GPU. Although you could have a really nice enterprise class GPU if your fans love you. Thank you. But a 4090 or a 3090 Ti or anything with a lot of VRAM works. Uh, side note, if you don't have a lot of VRAM, you can still have some fun here, but it's a lot harder to have fun. There's not as much room for activities. Now here's where you gotta pay attention. The CUDA setup here is at a very high level, uh, pretty slick in that you install the CUDA machinery on the Windows side and what ends up being installed in Linux is a lightweight stub and wrapper system that passes it off to Windows. So if you don't understand that and you're looking at tutorials and guides and everything on the internet, like if for example you elected to install Pop! OS and go through their CUDA installation guides, which are awesome, it works fabulously well on bare metal, you're gonna get yourself into a lot of trouble in the WSL context. And the reason for that is because enough of the hardware does pass through to WSL that those driver installers think that they can install and attach to your physical hardware. But the reality is they can't because they don't really have full access to the GPU. They have enough access to the GPU to be able to run CUDA workloads, but they don't have enough access to the GPU to be able to run really low level tasks like you would be doing through NVIDIA SMI. And yes, technically NVIDIA SMI does work in WSL, but it's because it's a lightweight wrapper, again, back to the Windows side of things. So we start with the Windows installation. This, this subtlety about, you know, left brain, right brain, WSL and then native Windows is something that you have to get straight in your head and keep straight and keep in mind as you read through documentation and tutorials because if you install a driver or you're something that interacts with the hardware at a low level on the Linux side, it's probably not going to work and it may even corrupt your WSL installation for these sorts of machine learning purposes. It's very subtle, very important, very easy to get it wrong. Oh, also, if you're planning to use this workstation for other development outside of just WSL and what WSL can give you, and like running Python under WSL, etc., etc., if you have full Visual Studio, not Visual Studio Code, but actual Visual Studio, you definitely want to install all of those things before you install the CUDA toolkit. The reason for that is the CUDA installer for Windows will detect all of those other things that are installed and then add plugins and extensions to those things to make it easier for you to do CUDA programming. At this point, I like to open up a new PowerShell terminal and run NVIDIA-SMI. You should be able to do NVIDIA and hit tab. There's that tab completion thing. Yeah, on the Windows side, not the Linux side, but tab completion anywhere you've got it, it's nice. Your NVIDIA-SMI output should be something like this. This means that it's working correctly. We can move on to the Linux part of this. So for the Linux part of this, again, NVIDIA has got the documentation basically 100% correct, no complaints, which is impressive. It's almost like there's just zillions and zillions and zillions of people installing this and they don't want the headache of supporting people that can't, you know, deal with something being slightly off from the documentation. So there's the NVIDIA GPU Accelerated Computing on WSL2, the guide, check that out, follow through the guide. Don't blindly copy paste the important part that I've added to the guide. 
I've done that only to make this video slightly easier. Once all that's done, we need to reboot our WSL installation again. Fortunately, we can do that by just launching another PowerShell terminal and telling it, hey, restart the WSL process. Boom, restart it. And if we run NVIDIA SMI, we should get output similar to this. Notice that when we ask where it's running from, it's running from this weird WSL path. If you're used to doing CUDA on native Linux before or on, on bare metal, this may be a little off-putting, but don't worry, this is how things work in WSL land. There really is a lot of magic happening under the hood here, but I'm just really excited that NVIDIA SMI is working. It suggests that Python and pretty much everything else that we're going to need is going to work. But I want to show you oh my ZSH, which is, you know, again, I really like the command prompt and you can do a lot of things to make the command prompt a lot more e efficient. And the nice thing about oh my ZSH is that there's a community working on updating the files that power your shell. So instead of you having a 10 year old bash RC that has all of your stuff in it, about a million of us uh, are updating their Z shell RC with fun, cool, interesting things. <laughs> so, eh. Z shell by itself is nothing special. Z, Z shell's been around for a while. But oh my ZSH is a, <laughs> ZSH, like just a, a distributed file that makes Z shell even more amazing. You can change your font, colors. That's a whole other rabbit hole for you to go down. Doesn't matter for this video. Maybe a future video if there's enough interest. Now's maybe also a good time to install PyCharm if you are into Python development. It's Python IDE from the JetBrains people. Visual Studio is good enough, especially with the extensions, but PyCharm is so much better. Uh, there's also Docker. I'll mention Docker. Uh, WSL doesn't really give us anything useful for Docker. The Docker Windows environment basically already has everything you need to be productive. And all WSL has is some little stubs and wrappers that'll poke at the Docker installation on the Windows side. Again, 56 cores, Monster Xeon workstation. You can do a lot of Dockerized development on this thing. You can probably run your entire production environment on this thing because it's so fire breathing. But Docker lets you run little lightweight, you know, like a Windows virtual machine, or if you had an, you know, an Nginx transparent proxy, or, uh, you know, uh, uh, a set of Docker containers to bootstrap your your application. Now is probably the time to install Docker and install the WSL extensions for Docker. And Microsoft fortunately has a good guide for that as well. You can follow it and then come back to the guide and you'll be all set. If you'd like a demo of that, uh, I found this repository on GitHub literally like 20 minutes before this video that combines DDEV, which is a, a, a Dockerized development environment for developing with the Drupal CMS. Drupal's kind of a complicated CMS. But instead of just living with the HTML output that Docker does, we layer on another level of complexity by adding a Gatsby JS front end to it. Gatsby JS is a static site generator. So Gatsby will connect to Drupal and slurp all of the content out of Drupal and then generate a really nice, fast, lightweight, you know, Reactized but static files uh, site based on the content in Drupal. And this is pretty much the the, the pinnacle of, of complexity for modern uh, development, modern web development. I mean, you could throw in some TypeScript processors in there and then you would, you would be all set for, you know, the modern web developer experience. Oh, it's not fun. It's a lot, it's sort of painful, but maybe, maybe life will get better. I don't know, we'll see. And so that gives you an idea of the kinds of things you could do with this. Machine learning works the same way, but we at Level 1 already wrote a guide for getting Automatic 11.11 up and running in a Docker environment, and you would be ready to do that on this machine as well. So if you wanted to put this tutorial down and go pick up that one, you totally could, but you don't even have to do that because Automatic 1.11.11 has moved on since that tutorial, and it's even easier to get it running just in a native Python environment. So you can connect it directly to CUDA under WSL and not have to run anything under Docker. And in case you're wondering, can we expose the Docker environment to CUDA? Yes, you can. You can pass CUDA through to all of your Docker containers. That's also not something historically that has worked super great, but because literally everybody is doing it, NVIDIA now actually supports it. Another side effect with this split personality is that you've got Git on Windows and Git on Linux. And usually there's a credential management aspect of that. You've got your source code repository up on GitHub. How do you manage credentials 
between logging in on GitHub automatically? Do you create a set of credentials on Windows? Do you create a set of credentials on Linux? Are there different credentials on each one? A lot of tutorials that already exist in the internet involve copying your SSH keys from one environment to the other. You don't really have to do that that way. The way that I would recommend that you do that is with an agent, but Microsoft also has a reasonable tutorial on using something called Git Credential Manager, which will let you run uh, you know, the binary that manages the Git credentials cross operating system. Wait, cross operating system? Yeah, check this out. So I just ran WSL CalSay. Whoa, what's going on here? CalSay is a fun little utility for Linux that uh, runs things at the command line. We could also maybe, maybe we want a calendar of 1752. Huh, interesting. This lets you run Linux command line programs from Windows, but you can also run Windows programs from Linux. So Git Credential Manager, all it really does is take the part of Windows that is dealing with your SSH keys and calls it from Linux. And to get Stable Diffusion set up, you're not really gonna need the Credential Manager thing, that's only if you, if you need it for your, you know, Git repositories that you have hosted somewhere else. Really, to get started, you just have to follow the guide. There's a lot of dependencies from Python and everything else, and I find it easier to start with automatic 111 and then use that to install stable diffusion you end up making a directory called repositories and then going into repositories and downloading stable diffusion and a few other things the full guides on the forum and it's going to walk you through the exact specifics but when you get to the end of all of the commands and everything else you basically just run this one python command that'll make sure that the gpu is available if it is from here we can run our Python command to boot up our automatic 111. And don't forget, once you set up your Conda environment, <laughs> that you restart the terminal, and then you run Python, and then Python, the first time you run it, is gonna download some stuff for this environment. And then you should be able to get to the web GUI at localhost. And from here, you can plug in repositories. Now, the old guide that we did a while ago, there's still some useful stuff in there. For example, you can download Stable Diffusion a lot newer than 1.5. I just did that as kind of an out of the box for this video. Uh, there are also a lot of helper scripts that you can add to Automatic 111 to help you with your prompt generation, the different genres that are supported, and so on and so forth. There are actually a lot of models on Hugging Face as well that have been trained on pretty much anything you can imagine, and that's ready to go out of the box. So you're pretty much good to go for everything CUDA, machine learning, image generation, etc., etc. If you want to do large language models, you can use this as a takeoff for large language models. But I would be remiss if I didn't mention Jupyter Notebooks. Let's say that you're a data scientist, or even just a regular scientist, or just somebody that works on technology stuff, and you're faced with helping other people understand data analytics, or understand web traffic, or understand whatever. You can build a notebook, a notebook in Jupyter Notebook with Python that does data processing, but give the users that are reading the notebook interactive controls over the data. So if you wanted to build a notebook, for example, that would do uh, e-commerce analysis or e even like think, you know, Monte Carlo analysis or stuff that you would normally do in a spreadsheet, you can give them sort of a step-by-step -step picture illustrated guide in a Jupyter notebook and give them some widgets that they can, you know, move a slider or put in some numbers or ask for a date range and manipulate the data that they're looking at in kind of a controlled way. Another thing I'll just give a quick mention to are Visual Studio Code extensions. There's a lot of extensions to do some really cool stuff. If you use VI or Vim for your editor, you can get an extension for Visual Studio Code that does the same key bindings and it works just the same for opening up new new panes, uh, new columns, opening files, file navigation, the whole nine yards. If you use Emacs, same deal. There's some really good extensions for Visual Studio Code that give you the same Emacs shortcuts. If you're a big user of org mode in Emacs, there's even a plugin for org mode that's about 78% as good as org mode in Emacs. It's not bad. Um, and you can be productive, you know, sort of cross-system, cross-platform. One of the ways that I like to use Visual Studio Code is to create a Visual Studio configuration file with the project that when you open the project, it'll open all of the relevant directories, but it also opens terminal windows to the production, dev, and staging environments, which is really nice. And that comes in handy to use that aforementioned SSH agent to control which terminals actually open because 
you don't necessarily want to be able to log into production that easily. Uh, one other thing that I'll mention is Dev Drive. Uh, Dev Drive is an extension to Windows because Microsoft sort of recognizes that they've painted themselves into a corner a little bit with NTFS. NTFS is sort of garbage for this and the general architecture of Windows for this kind of development where you're dealing with a Git repository that has a billion tiny files is painful at best. Because Windows Defender is scanning all the files as you create them and it's just, it's a mess. What Dev Drive promises to do is to create a container, to create a volume that uses ReFS, which is Microsoft's newer file system, which deals with file access and these sorts of usage patterns a little better in the first place. And in the second place, has a little bit better telemetry and hooks into Windows Defender for the malware scanner uh, so that it doesn't generate quite as much complexity and overhead when you're working with um, these kinds of developer workflows. You sort of end up trusting the drive and there's some trade-offs with that. And it's a good strategy. It's good to see Microsoft doing this. It'll definitely help developer workflows. It's still nowhere near as fast as a native Linux system or you know native Linux file systems, XFS, EXT4, even, even ZFS, believe it or not, is faster than NTFS. And when ZFS is faster for this kind of workload, you know that something has gone catastrophically wrong with your file system. But Microsoft, you know, with Azure, they're learning and they're dogfooding their own stuff and things are getting better, so that's nice. And this is not an unreasonable developer experience at this point. You, you get all the power and flexibility of Linux under Windows with no loss of anything that is running under Windows. And you're even able to share hardware pretty seamlessly between the Linux instance and Windows. It really is a, a thing that a lot of people are doing. So I thought I'd take it for a spin on our Falcon Northwest workstation, which continually impresses me with just how, how well Falcon Northwest has put the system together. Now they offer Intel systems, they offer AMD systems. I'm sure that an AMD system would be just as good. But this particular configuration, I wanted to take a look at machine learning with OpenVINO and one API. And I wanted to show sort of the perfect setup, or at least my perfect setup for this. Now, you've probably got a lot of tips and tricks yourself if you've watched the video this long. And if you want to share those on the forum at Level 1 Text, that would be great, because maybe I can incorporate that into a future video, or maybe I can learn something myself. I'd, I'd love, like, how are you using it? What, what hard won arcane knowledge do you have? It took me a little bit when I figured out the whole disable WSL file paths thing. It actually was reading a GitHub issue because something else was driving me insane. It's like, wait, that's what's causing the slowdown? It's because it's scanning the file paths on Windows? Oh, that makes so much sense. I should have realized that. And then the fix, and then there was so much less suffering once I got that in there. So that was nice. I'm Wendell, this is level one. This has been the ultimate developer workstation setup. I'm signing out and you can find me in the level one forums. Thank you.